Since medieval times, Ireland had been under English rule. Many wars and rebellions from the Gaelic Irish were fought, but England steadily grew in power. Since 1297, there was a British Parliament in Ireland, which sort of took care of Irish business, but as Republican ideals spread from the American and French revolutions, Theobald Wolfstone of the United Irishmen led a rebellion in 1798 to create an Irish Republic, but they failed. After this, Parliament was taken away from Ireland and ruled directly from London, leading to Ireland being hugely neglected when the potato crops failed year after year in the late 1840s, and the Irish were forced to sell their other crops. Millions of people died of starvation and disease, while millions more left Ireland, never to return. Throughout the 19th century, support was growing for home rule, Ireland to be ruled from Dublin once more. This coincided with a huge cultural movement, the Gaelic Revival, in which Irish music, language and sports were growing back in popularity. The Republican movement had received a tricolour from France in 1848, symbolising a Republic of Ireland, peace between its people, Catholic and Protestant. An underground Republican movement, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, also began to make moves. Not everyone in Ireland supported home rule, however. The north of Ireland, Ulster, had been predominantly Protestant since the Ulster plantations in the 17th century. Industry was going strong for them, and they strongly supported the union with Britain. They believed home rule would result in Ireland being controlled by the Catholic Church. They promised to fight if Ireland got home rule. Both sides armed themselves, forming the Ulster Volunteers and the Irish Volunteers. A young poet and teacher named Patrick Pierce moved up the ranks of the Irish Volunteers and joined the IRB. He was inspired by the mythological hero Coo Cullen and Irish Republican heroes Wolf Tone and Robert Emmett, all of whom died in the defence of their ideals. The Dublin lockout of 1913 saw Socialist leader James Connolly come to prominence in setting up the Citizens' Army in Dublin to protect the workers on strike. In 1914, Home Rule was voted into Parliament, but an Austro-Hungarian Archduke was shot in Sarajevo sparking off the First World War. Home rule was put on hold till after the war. There was a split in the Irish volunteers. Some believed they should go off and fight for the freedom of small nations and come back as a fully trained army for Ireland. Others, such as Thomas Clark, believed that now was the time to strike while Britain was distracted by the war in Europe. In 1915, at the funeral of Fenian leader Jeremiah O'Donovan Rossa, Patrick Pearce gave a rousing speech of how Ireland unfree will never be at peace. The older Fenian leaders chose him to speak, as he represented the new, younger generation of Irish republicanism. Connolly thought that the Irish volunteers weren't concerned with the working people, and he even threatened to send his citizens' army up against the British in 1916. The IRB swooped in, talked him down and coaxed him into joining them as they continued their plans. The Irish Women's Council, come on the man, who were akin to the suffragette movement, were also brought into the fray. The plan for the Rising was for regiments of Irish volunteers to parade on Easter Sunday throughout the country. A totally acceptable cover story for the British, but once in place, they would capture strategic spots and hold the country, forcing Britain to relinquish control while it fought in the trenches. All of this was kept secret from Owen McNeill, the leader of the Irish volunteers, who thought it was crazy to go up against the highly trained, highly armed British army. Bulmer Hobson, who was against the Rising, was kidnapped on Good Friday and held until the Rising got underway. McNeill was all set to call off the Rising, but was told about the IRB securing weapons from Germany, but the German ship carrying the weapons was captured before it could land. When McNeil found out, he sent a countermanding order throughout the country stopping volunteers from doing anything on Easter Sunday. The IRB leaders decided to go ahead with the Rising on Easter Monday at noon, but it was difficult to send word out to the rest of the country at such short notice. The conflict thusly would be mainly centred around Dublin. They drafted and signed the Proclamation of Independence, proclaiming an Irish Republic with Patrick Pearce as its president. Easter Monday came and the Irish Volunteers and the Irish Citizens' Army gathered at Liberty Hall and marched on Sackville Street. Their target was the General Post Office, which would be their main headquarters, cutting off the main station of wireless communication. They captured the GPO and Pearce stepped out in front and read the proclamation, declaring the right of the people of Ireland to the ownership of Ireland. At this time, many people didn't know what was going on. Many Irish people were quite happy with the status quo of being part of Britain. As far as they were concerned, the fighting should be happening out in France. The battalions were sent to various strategic buildings in the city to try and hold the city centre for as long as possible. An attempt was made to capture Dublin Castle, the British headquarters in Ireland. It was here the first shot was fired and the unarmed Constable O'Brien was shot dead. The castle gates were closed and the rebels fell back to the adjoining city hall, despite Dublin Castle being painfully undermanned at the start of the Rising. None of the major train stations or ports were captured, which allowed for the eventual arrival of British reinforcements. As chaos descended upon the streets of Dublin, the Dubliners themselves, who lived in some of the poorest conditions in Europe, began looting the shops. Martial law was declared and Brigadier General Lowe took charge of the forces in Dublin. When he arrived, there were just over 1,000 British troops in Dublin. He housed the troops in Trinity College and set up artillery aimed at the rebels. British forces set up barricades out of anything they could find throughout the streets to prevent the movement of Irish troops. They relied heavily on artillery bombardment rather than direct assaults, giving the rebels nothing to shoot at. 
Messages were sent between the Irish forces via little boys and women on bikes. Francis Sheehy Skeffington, a pacifist trying to stop looters, was arrested by the British and executed the next morning for no apparent reason. Late Tuesday night, British reinforcements landed at Kingstown Harbour and on Wednesday began to march in the city centre. As they walked past the RDS, they were applauded by Dublin civilians. But things changed as they approached the Grand Canal. Eamon de Valera had captured Boland's Mill and his soldiers had taken up positions aimed at Mount Street Bridge. The British soldiers marched endlessly into the line of fire as the bodies piled up until the volunteers were out of ammo and the British eventually got grenades. The British gunboat Helga came up the Liffey and demolished Liberty Hall. On Thursday, while seeing to the troops in front of the GPO, James Connolly was hit in the leg by a ricocheting bullet. He was unable to walk for the rest of the Rising. Along North King Street, while trying to advance against rebel positions, British soldiers burrowed through civilian houses, killing a few accused of being rebels. General Sir John Maxwell was sent from London with reinforcements. By Friday, there were over 16,000 British soldiers in Dublin. Sackville Street was ablaze from all the shelling. As the flames closed in on the GPO, Pierce called a retreat to the Williams and Woods factory on King's End Street, but they became entrenched in the buildings of Moor Street. During the retreat, the O'Rahilly was shot dead, the only rising leader to be killed during the fighting. The centre of Dublin had been greatly destroyed, the first European city since the Napoleonic Wars to suffer such destruction. Many innocent civilians were caught up in the attacks and killed. The civilian casualties during the Rising was much greater than military casualties. As the civilian death toll rose, Pierce and Connolly decided to surrender. Nurse Elizabeth O'Farrell was sent out with a white flag. Pierce then officially surrendered to General Lowe. The message spread and the other Irish battalions around the city stood down. As the women of Command the Man surrendered, some British authorities said that they could just go home. The women insisted on being arrested with their Irish brothers in arms. The court's martial for the leaders would be in Richmond Barracks under General Blackadder. Yes, that was actually his name. Maxwell thought that he would make an example of them and sentenced them to death. The executions began on May 3rd in Kilmainham Jail and continued into the following week. Pierce was executed on the first day, Connolly on the last. Some leaders avoided execution. Eamon de Valera, as he was born in the United States, Constance Markovich, because she was a woman. As the executions rang on, the public began to see these troublemakers become martyrs. They were dying for something. An Irish Republic. British Prime Minister H.H. Asquith arrived in Dublin, concerned at the rate of the executions so soon after the rebellion, and called a stop to further executions. In Cork, Thomas Kent, a volunteer officer who had stayed at home, was executed. Roger Casement, who negotiated with the Germans, would be executed in England later that year for treason. When Irish soldiers returned from the war in Europe, they returned to a changed Ireland. They expected a hero's welcome, but they were shunned for fighting for the British. In the following years, Sinn Féin would rise in power and would win a landslide victory in the elections of 1919. These elected officials would sit in Dáil Éireann, the new self-proclaimed Irish government. The men and women of the Rising who survived would go on to lead Ireland to ultimate independence, but not before a brutal civil war. The Protestants of six counties in the north of Ireland would opt out of the Irish Free State and become what is now Northern Ireland. By the time Eamon de Valera came into power in the 1930s and had a new Irish constitution drafted, he allowed the Catholic Church to have a lot of influence within the constitution and the state itself. And that turned out very well. The statue of Coo Cullen stands in the GPO today, the warrior who died defending his homeland against all odds. It symbolises the men and women who stood up to the might of the British Empire. The legacy of the Rising lies in the Republic we now have today. Some wonder if the Republic resembles the independence proclaimed by the Rising leaders a century ago. What do you think? Coming to a theatre near you very soon, as long as you're in Ireland. McCaig and O'Brien present The Rising and by Ways of Interlude World War I by Joe O'Byrne. Starring myself, John D. Ruddy. We bring to life the events of 1916 on the stage through song, dance and many characters. The Irish Times calls it 90 minutes of exhilarating theatre, so it must be good. Check out dates and updates here. Thank you so much for all the support as always. I wish to dedicate this video to my mother, Kathleen Ruddy, who passed away at the end of 2015. She was always so supportive of these videos. All my love. Don't forget to follow me on Facebook and Twitter to keep up to date with all my antics. Find out about World War I and more in my other history videos. You can help support the creation of videos and access exclusive content by donating on Patreon. The more support, the faster I'll get these made. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and share.